Today we have a good talk. Let me tell you about uh, next month before we get started. Next month, Dr. Jen Lamb will speak on the secret lives of salamanders. So please come back for that. But today we have a very interesting talk that I'm really looking forward to. Um, Dr. Frank Hensley is a professor of biology at MC Mississippi College and joined the faculty there in 2011 and currently teaches general biology to herpetology and ornithology. His area of expertise is animal ecology. Dr. Hensley earned his undergraduate degree at Baylor University and his graduate degrees at the University of Florida and uh, conducted his doctoral research at the Savannah River Ecology Lab. His primary research interest is the ecology and conservation of vertebrates that are difficult to study due to low population density or cryptic habitats. And this includes not only endangered species, but also common species such as bats and snakes. He's interested in activity patterns, uh, particularly habitat use and spatial ecology, such as movement and migration patterns. He's also particularly interested in how amphibian and reptile populations are influenced by invasive species of plants and animals. Dr. Hensley enjoys wildlife photography, and uh, when he's not teaching, he says that he would be quite happy to waste enormous amounts of time trying to learn to be a better photographer. So please help me welcome Dr. Frank Hensley. Uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it very much. Um, and uh, to Libby and Mary for inviting me or twisting my arm, one or the other. I'm not sure which that was. But um, uh, I'm, I really am happy to be here. And uh, I've been looking forward to this in particular because it gives me an excuse to not grade exams. So <laughs> uh, I, as soon as we're done here, I do have to finish grading for the semester. Um, I want to talk to you today um, about a methodology that my students and I have been playing with and I'll, I'll show you some data, but this is more of a sort of a what works and what doesn't kind of thing. So um, uh, I guess I have to find the clicker that's in my pocket if we're ever going to get to the next slide. Um, uh, whoops, boy, that's sensitive. <laughs> uh, you're probably familiar with the idea of camera traps. Uh, lots of wildlife biology today is done using camera traps. And for the most part, what that does is it, it relies on motion-activated photography. So um, uh, this is a, a photo that a friend of mine took um, down in Honduras of a jaguar. And I just think it's really cool that you can you know, sort of sneak up on this jaguar electronically right, and uh, find out what it's doing and when it came by and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of motion-activated photography out there. And so here's a motion activated photo of uh, wild turkeys here in Mississippi. Uh, we have the normal wild turkey on the right and the headless version on the left. Um, uh, here's a motion activated picture of a family of raccoons. Uh, there's mama raccoon right there and she's got four kids. This one is a melanistic individual. Uh, I don't, I've never seen a raccoon that was that much darker than other raccoons, but you know, it's an interesting little observation. Uh, here's a squirrel on a log, motion-activated photo. The, the, the squirrel moved into the scene. The camera picked that up. Um, this is at uh, 10.30 in the morning. And uh, the next day, hello, the next day, um, uh, in late afternoon, when the sunlight is low, uh, the camera switches over to infrared. And so we get this night vision photo of a squirrel crossing a log. It's still before sunset. Um, but the squirrel crossing the log there. So motion activated photography is used a lot here in, in wildlife biology. And there's a device, uh, a, a transistor of sorts, uh, that can sense a moving heat source. And so I thought this was a good looking heat source to put in the picture. Uh, fire breathing dragon should be warm enough that when it moves through the area, um, the sensor has sort of two channels shown in pink and green. And when a uh, uh, heat source moves across both of those, you get kind of a positive voltage and then a negative voltage. And uh, when the camera detects that spike of voltage, uh, it fires a picture. All right. Um, uh, can you tell what that is? 
The log is empty, but look in the, in the water below the log. What do you see? Yeah, okay, so there's a river otter in the picture. Next picture, there's a river otter under the log. There's a river otter under the log. There's a fourth one. But the thing is, none of these pictures was motion activated. All four of these pictures were taken because I programmed the camera to take a photo every minute. And uh, in the 22 minutes separating the first and the last photo, that otter was in and out of this puddle in the stream, but it never triggered the camera. The camera didn't see the otter in the middle of the day. And I suspect, um, this is outside my area of expertise, that what's going on is the otter's fur is wet, and the camera sees the otter's fur as having essentially the same infrared temperature as the puddle, and it can't detect a difference, so the camera doesn't see this. Um, and that's a problem if you wanted to study this organism and you're relying on motion-activated photography to tell you where it is, right? Um, so in 22 plus minutes, it never, it never fired the camera once. Right. Um, take a look at this scene. There's no animal in this picture. All right. Um, but compare it to the next scene, and I'll try to toggle back and forth a little bit. Watch what happens. Let me go back. Do you see the difference? Something walked through in front of the camera. Something. And it disturbed the leaves. And you can see a trail that it left. Um, uh, the first photo is at 1.15 a.m., and the next photo is at 1.16 a.m., but the camera didn't detect the animal. Can wind activate it? Can it shouldn't. Wind shouldn't activate it, okay? But yes, you can get false positive, you, you can get photos where moving vegetation can trigger it. That, is, that can be a problem, okay? Uh, but... but I missed something, I don't know what, I'll never know what walked through here. Okay, so motion activated photography is not 100% reliable. It misses animals that are there, it misses animals that pass by. Um, so for it to work, you have to have a temperature differential between the animal and its environment, and the animal has to move fast enough and trigger both halves of that sensor. And only under those conditions does the camera fire a picture. Okay. Um, so how do you camera trap animals that can't trigger the camera or won't trigger the camera reliably? Um, uh, that's a plain-bellied water snake up there. And of course, uh, snakes are ectotherms. The snake's body temperature is probably not significantly different from the water it's in. Uh, and it's probably not moving particularly fast. And it's not very big. So the camera is not going to pick up that snake. And you'll notice down here at the bottom of the screen, uh, this camera has labeled this photo TL, time lapse. I programmed the camera to take a picture on schedule, and I got lucky, right? And the snake was there when the camera fired. Okay. Um, I got interested in this about 30 years ago um, when I was a grad student at the University of Florida, and there was a graduate student there um, named Mark Stowe, and he was studying bolus spiders. This is a bolus spider right here. You may not be familiar with him because there's only one species in the U.S. as far as I know. Um, lives in Florida. Um, and what these spiders do is they hang all night motionless from a single thread. And then if you look, uh, the spider is holding a little piece of silk with a sticky glob of silk on the end. And the spider just hangs there motionless, but it releases a pheromone that smells and is actually chemically identical to um, the scent of a female moth. And so male moths detect the scent and they fly up to the spider thinking they're going to find love and happiness. And instead the spider swings that sticky weapon and it sticks to the moth's wing and then the spider reels the moth in and bites the moth and eats it. And so um, Mark Stowe was studying this uh, back in the, uh, in the late 80s. Um, but technology was limited. So what he did is he got a video camera that you could buy you know, down at uh, your electronics store, Circuit City, I think, was the place back then. And he would set the video camera, point it at the hunting spider, and just leave it all night. And then the next day, he would put the, the VHS tape in his tape deck, and he would put it on fast forward. And some of you may remember uh, going through a movie or something, fast forwarding, and you get this blurry image. Remember that streaky look that you could get? Um, and so he would put it on fast forward and he would watch an eight hour video, but it would take him two hours to watch it or something. And then if he saw 
a moth approach and, a, and an attack, then he'd stop and back up and watch the event in real time. But that he was time lapsing, all right? Um, and so uh, I thought that was a really cool idea to allow him to basically watch a spider all night, but it didn't involve the time commitment and he didn't lose any sleep, you know? Um, just set the camera and check it the next morning. So that was pretty cool. Um, but a couple of years ago, I became familiar with some work done by uh, Melissa Armello out in Arizona, and she's working on Arizona black rattlesnakes. And uh, she found the places these rattlesnakes were hanging out. And what she would do uh, is set a camera uh, to time lapse and monitor the snake activity. And she discovered some uh, pretty interesting things, like uh, female rattlesnakes that had these communal maternal dens where they gathered up and they gave birth in the same place together. And then the females uh, would tend the young. And so by using her camera, she could keep track of how many snakes were at, uh, you know, under a given rock or something. And when the young are first born, for the first couple of weeks, there's always an adult snake in attendance. They never leave the young unaccompanied. And the females take turns watching each other's babies. And even on a few occasions, adult males would stay with the babies while the females were all off hunting. Um, and so uh, what, what Melissa was able to do was get at the social behavior of animals that most people think are probably not very social. You don't think of rattlesnakes as being particularly social and having complex behaviors. Um, so she recorded uh, this cooperative parental care and some interesting anti-predator behavior and things like that. And I was really intrigued by that. I thought, what a great technique for studying reptiles that you can't study with motion-activated photography. So I contacted her, and uh, she was really generous to offer me some advice on cameras and technology and things like that. Um, so uh, let me give you a quick overview of uh, sort of some advantages and disadvantages, and then I'm going to tell you about some projects I've been doing with my students. Okay? So um, uh, PIR, motion-activated or passive infrared camera trapping, has a couple of advantages. You can monitor 24-7, 365. You put the camera out there, you don't need to be there, right? So it's not a huge time investment on the part of the human being. Um, and you're not out there disturbing the animals. The camera is sitting there silently doing its job, and you're not there. Um, so it has certain advantages uh, for being able to see what the animals are doing. It's not that expensive. All right? There's a whole lot of you know, uh, issues with cost when it comes to scientific research, and this is a fairly cheap way to do it. And if you use PIR, if you use motion activated, you get an animal in almost every picture. You do get some false positives where the wind blows, the vegetation moves, and the camera gets confused and it triggers. But for the most part, you're going to get an animal in most photos. I have a question. It's motion You can in cold conditions as long as the organism is warmer than the background, right? Uh, and so a cold background is going to make it easier because you're going to have a bigger temperature differential. Um, so I, I haven't really dug into this to, to give you a specific answer, but I suspect that your ability to detect a really small animal, uh, a chipmunk, for example, or a mouse, is going to be better in a cold environment than in an environment where the background temperature is closer to the body temperature of that small animal. All right. um, PIR's biggest disadvantage, at least from my perspective, is it's biased toward large endotherms. It's really good for jaguars, right? but it's not so good for mice or snakes or something like that. Um, so time lapse offers a, an alternative here. Um, one of them is you can detect animals regardless of size, speed, or temperature. Okay, little, little cold animals, you can pick them up. Here's a, a, another you know, water snake in the, in the creek here. Um, and that would never trigger a motion-activated camera, but the uh, uh, time-lapse caught it. All right. PIR is still available, so a camera that's doing time-lapse photography can also be watching for motion. Um, and so that's a good thing. Right? You can still have that opportunity. The world's going dark on me. Should have eaten something before I talk. <laughs> All right. Um, but there are certain disadvantages to this. Uh, one of them is you get thousands and thousands of photos that have no animals in them. And uh, data storage becomes an issue very quickly. 
Um, it drains camera batteries very quickly. Um, and processing thousands of photos becomes labor intensive. Okay? Uh, you're searching for needles in a haystack. Um, and so it really does become uh, a big challenge uh, to find the animals amongst thousands of photos that don't have animals. Okay, um, and so uh, this is what it looks like when we go through a stack of photos. And if you're watching closely, uh, did you see it? Okay, what did you see? We try to run through photos at about four per second. Okay, um, we typically are tackling stacks of photos that are about 10,000 photos at a shot. And so but you can't go very slow or you, you're going to take forever. Um, I'm going to see if I can play that again. Will this thing back up for me? I didn't expect the screen to go dark. Let's try again. Watch carefully. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you get it that time? Yeah. Okay. There was a white-tailed deer in two frames. Did you also see the squirrel? <laughs> see if I can back up one more time. Uh, after the deer, after the deer, watch the log. Deer, deer. <coughs> Squirrel. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, one of the advantages of being a professor with some uh, uh, power over large groups of students is I can incentivize students to go through some of this. Um, and so that's really helpful. All right. Uh, so here's what I want to do, is I want to give you an overview of uh, four projects that my students and I have attempted to use this approach, time-lapse photography. I'll show you some data and talk to you about uh, what some of these projects are telling us and maybe uh, what the uh, take-home messages might be. I have to say, um, a lot of what I'm going to show you, if I, if I make a conclusive statement, think of it as tentative. Okay. Trends in the data, um, rather than definitive, I'm sure that's the right way to analyze it. But talk to you about what we've learned, what works, what doesn't work, etc. as we go through here. So the first thing I want to tell you about is a project that um, was done in my lab. Uh, Elizabeth Russell was a graduate student in my lab, did her master's thesis on this with me. And some of you know Elizabeth because she has been a volunteer and an employee here at the museum. Um, and so Elizabeth and I were looking at turtle basking behavior, and we had questions like, when do turtles bask? You've all seen turtles on a log. Um, when do they do that? For how long do they do that? Um, you've seen turtles gather up on a log. Well, is that a preferred behavior? Do they like to gather together? Or is that something that, you know, they don't have a choice? Um, and what about sex differences? Do male and female turtles have different preferences or different patterns in their behavior? Um, so, that's what Elizabeth and I tackled. Uh-oh, my malware bytes is not up to date. Uh, should we update before we go on? Let's not. All right. Um, here's what our setup looks like. Um, and so we built this artificial basking platform with three ramps. And so a turtle has a choice to climb up each of these three ramps. And if there are already turtles on one of these ramps, the turtle then can choose Am I going to join another turtle, or am I going to perhaps climb up an empty ramp? Um, and I thought this was going to be a video that would play, but it hasn't played. Donald, do you... I'll click. There you go. All right, so this is a series of time-lapse photographs uh, of turtles basking on our basking platform. And it's, it's just fun to watch, you know? Um, so here's this turtle basking all by itself, and then it gets joined by two others, and then there's a little bit of shuffling, and then the second ramp gets occupied, and isn't that cute? You just want to watch. So, all right. So what did Elizabeth learn from this? Um, in general, large female turtles bask longer than smaller male turtles. Okay, that was one result, and that was something we kind of predicted that a bigger animal should take longer to warm up. All right. Plus, if females are trying to maintain a higher body temperature because they are trying to develop eggs, that would make sense for them to bask longer. Things like that. So that wasn't a big surprise, but uh, the data clearly supported that one. Um, males showed us no preference for whether they basked alone or with another turtle. When given the choice, they flipped a coin. They didn't seem to care. 
all right, whether to climb up with another turtle or to uh, go it alone. Females, on the other hand, showed a statistically significant tendency to join males more often than you would expect by random chance, which was a surprise because you would think the females would mostly avoid males because they would want to avoid the harassment that they would subject themselves to uh, by being close to male turtles. Uh, might get some unwanted attention there. However, although females had a tendency to join males more often than we expected, they tended to displace the male. They'd climb up and shove him off. Okay. Um, now, our sample size is a little bit low. I'm not sure we have enough data to really publish that, but at least that's the direction uh, the results went. Um, and I think it, it showed us that we could effectively use time-lapse photography uh, to understand some aspects of turtle basking behavior. And by the way, I, I forgot to look this up, and Elizabeth would, would uh, be upset with me for, for not mentioning this. I think she looked at around 700,000 photos uh, in the process of this project. She used uh, uh, a year worth of data, so we looked at the whole year for seasonal patterns as well. Um, and I should have put up here, one of the things she found was... Um, Male turtles started basking about a month earlier in spring than females did. And we didn't expect that. Um, so, can't get it all on one slide. All right. Mm. Um, but males showed no tendency to displace each other. When a male joined another turtle, it didn't push that other turtle off. Um, so, males were nicer than females, I guess. Um, oops. Back up. All right. Um, one of the things I learned hard lesson here is that um, you would think that pretty much any wooden structure you put out in a pond, a turtle's going to climb up on and bask. Um, my f first version of the ramp I built, they wouldn't touch. Um, and uh, Well, it was too flat. Um, they, they have a hard time doing a push-up to get themselves out of the water up onto a flat platform. Uh, but once the ramp had an underwater approach, then they were good to go. Tom, question? Uh, this was uh, out at uh, the big pond at, Ch at Choctaw Trails. So Choctaw Trails is a property that Mississippi College owns. So I don't, you probably saw it out there. No? Out in the middle of the pond. The structure was out there for two years. So anyway, um, and we also discovered that, you know, if you want to identify individual animals in a photo, that's difficult. And so uh, we tried various methods of marking turtles to, to be able to figure out who's who. So, all right, the second project I want to mention briefly um, is actually Tom's project. Um, uh, Tom and De Deborah Mann have been working on um, Plethon websteri, this endangered salamander population just west of uh, Clinton. And uh, Tom and Deborah have been using drift fences. Um, in the woods, and the salamanders migrate through the woods. Tell, if I summarize incorrectly, he's going to chime in here. We good? All right. Uh, uh, anyway, the salamanders will climb up these drift fences, and Tom and Deb can count them and do all the science they do. I hope you've had a chance to hear one of his talks in the last couple of years. Well, Tom and I were talking, and I got the idea, what if I put a camera on his drift fences? Because he can't be there all the time to count how many salamanders. They climb up the fence, and they jump off. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to use camera monitoring to figure out just how many salamanders are going over these fences when nobody's there watching? So that was the, that was the uh, motivation for this. So I got another little video for you. Let's see if it'll play. There it is. Um, if you look carefully, I, it's, this, it's supposed to loop. It didn't loop. Oh, well. I'm going to back up and do it again. The version of PowerPoint that I built this on is not the same version that I think is on. Well, watch the top of the fence and you'll see a tiny little something that runs right across the top here. I'll do it one more time. Come on. Got to go forward. Watch the top of the fence right there. Anyway, um, it turns out that it's really difficult to get the camera aimed where you want it. These cameras are not made to be looked through. They don't have a viewfinder. Getting them lined up to where the salamanders are going to be and identifying salamanders. It turns out that slugs and millipedes and other species of salamanders and all sorts of stuff in the leaves, on the, these fabric fences, um, 
it was just impossible to keep track of what was a salamander, what wasn't, what was going over the fence, what was climbing up. And they do things like in this first picture. They climb up the fences, but they climb up right here where the post is, and the fabric tends to fold a little bit, and they'll go up through a crease in the fabric, and you can't see them. And then you see it on top of the fence, and you don't know which side of the fence did it come up, and which side did it go down. And so it was a good idea, we thought, but in practical application, it just didn't work well. We just couldn't keep track of salamanders well enough to have data that would, would be meaningful. So um, I gave up, and I think uh, uh, Tom has been disappointed in me ever since. All right, so uh, one more time, there goes the salamander across the top edge of the fence. Um, and by the way, you can see, well, it's gone now, forget it. Uh, the, there was a camera on the other side of the fence looking back at the one that you were looking through. Let's move on. Okay, um, third project I want to talk about is monitoring a stream community. And uh, I've been doing this work for the last year plus um, with a lot of student involvement, but in particular, Hannah McGuire, Kelsey Houghton, and Mike Reeves have been helping me. And Hannah and Mike are both here today, and that's really amazing because by this time of the semester, they should be sick of listening to me. But they came, so uh, I didn't get a single laugh, especially from those two, because they're sick of listening to me. Um, what we've got is we've got five cameras spread out over um, about 100 meters of stream, and most people set up a game camera pointed horizontally, but I go up high and point them down. So I can look down into the stream bed. Um, and you may have been able to tell that from some of the previous shots that you've seen. And what we try to do is cover different microhabitats. So some deeper water, mud bars, gravel bars, um, uh, and logs that cross the stream, looking at which of these microhabitats might be attractive to different species of vertebrates. Okay? So when I showed you the otter pictures early on, there's a big log in the picture. That's, that's intentional to try to see if logs are an important piece of habitat, for example. Um, so in the last year and a half, we have collected more than a million photographs from five cameras. And we have processed, Hannah, are we over 700,000? Almost. Okay, about 700,000 photos, but we've got a lot more to go through. So can't keep up. Uh, with the data load. Here's just a, a graph of the 2017 effort. And so what I've done is I've spread out on the y-axis here, you've got distance along the stream. So the downstream camera is here. Then there's a pair of cameras close to each other, one a little further upstream and one a, a bit further upstream. So there's about uh, 85 meters between these cameras. And because the cameras can see uh, you know, a width of field, it gives you a total of about 100 meters of, of sp uh, stream that's being surveilled. And you see, like, some cameras we've covered the year more effectively than other cameras, and those are technological issues I could explain later if anybody really wants to get into it. Um, but for most of the year, we had multiple cameras on the screen. Uh, we've really tried to keep track of 24-7 what's going on in this little piece of, of stream. Um, and the number one creatures we see are raccoons. That's probably not a surprise. And although I'm a herpetologist, I'll take raccoon data if it's going to be there. Um, so one of the things we've done this year is we've analyzed raccoon data um, because it's the biggest data set we've got. And we thought that might be a nice way to compare whether um, our time-lapse method tells us the same things about raccoon ecology that other people are learning using motion-activated cameras, for example. Um, so here's a graph of raccoon activity. I'll walk you through this a little bit. We've got date across the x-axis down here from January 1st to December 31st of 2017. Um, the sunrise time is this blue bar, and so this is midnight, 6 a.m., uh, here's noon, right in the middle. Sunset is the green bar, and of course it changes over the year. Uh, and then here's midnight of the next day. Um, and so what you'll see is a couple of patterns emerge from this. One is that daytime activity in raccoons is a summer thing, which is not what I would have guessed. Um, uh, but diurnal activity is mostly a summer thing at our stream. Um, uh, secondly... Um, winter activity 
uh, is nighttime cold activity. If you, if you back up here, uh, you'll see that in the winter here, uh, late fall, no, we got no activity during the daytime, right? Uh, early here, January, no raccoon activity during the daytime. Ac the raccoons are active, um, you know, around midnight and 3 a.m. in the coldest months of the year, which I was a little surprised at. And they seem undeterred by temperatures. We got uh, our lowest uh, uh, temperature. This raccoon was at about a minus three or four degrees Celsius. And it was standing in the water. I wouldn't be standing in the water at minus three degrees Celsius, but the raccoon didn't seem to mind. Um, another kind of fun pattern is raccoons take a siesta from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. We never saw any raccoon activity. That's, that's the morning siesta time, apparently. Um, and from 10 a.m. on, you can begin to get some uh, activity in the warmer months. Um, but uh, uh, cold, middle of the night kind of activity. I don't know what they're feeding on. I don't know what they're out there after, but there must be something that they can catch in the middle of the night in January that is keeping them, keeping them fed through the winter. So. That was a little bit of a surprise to me that uh, they would have that kind of a schedule. So morning siesta. All right. Um, uh, there's the summary. Um, raccoons are active in the cold. Morning siesta. Strictly nocturnal in the winter. That's what the, the data shows so far. But I haven't read enough raccoon literature to see what other people are finding. So it's just not my thing. Um, and so I probably have to read quite a bit before I find out whether any of our observations are abnormal or whether uh, you know, this is stuff that other people already know about raccoons and I'm just coming to the game late. So uh, that's raccoon data, but uh, there are other interesting things. Can, can you identify what's in this picture? River otter. That's a river otter. Do you see it? That's a river otter right there. Okay. Um, and 3.36 in the morning, November 4th, 21 degrees Celsius, okay? So the river otter activity in the middle of the night. The first time we got a river otter on camera, this stream is about six feet wide and about, you know, a foot deep most places. I never would have guessed it was otter habitat. And so the first time we got a river otter, I thought, well, this is an anomaly. We're never going to see this again. Um, uh, and it turns out that uh, we've had otters multiple days uh, through 2017. Um, so I don't know enough otter ecology to know, you know, do otters routinely move up and down little small streams and visit the same site over and over? We've only ever seen one at a time. Never seen two otters on camera at once. Don't know if it's the same individual all year long or what. Um, so, but I'm, I'm intrigued by that tiny data set um, we need to talk to some otter specialists, I think, to find out whether this is, you know, exactly typical or if there's anything noteworthy here. Uh, it's noteworthy to me. So, interestingly enough, all of the photos are time lapse. We've not had the otter trigger a camera with body heat in motion a single time. Um, and so, I would think somebody who's studying otters with cameras would want to know that they're probably missing a lot of detections if they're just using um, motion activation. So, um, but I'm a herpetologist, uh, and I really got into this because I was intrigued by rattlesnake studies, and I thought, let's see what we can do with time-lapse cameras and snakes in Mississippi. Um, and so uh, this is what uh, Hannah and Kelsey and Mike and I have uh, really uh, focused more of our attention on lately. So I already showed you this picture, but there's a plain belly water snake up here. And in this shot down here, um, here's a cotton mouth right here. And those are the two uh, aquatic snakes that we can identify out here at the stream with some reliability uh, that we get on camera with some frequency. So uh, same kind of graph as with the raccoons. Date for 2017, the whole year. Sunrise is the blue line. Sunset is the green line. And a couple of patterns emerge from our, our snake detections. Um, all the gray dots are cotton mouths. The blue dots are Nerodia, water snakes. And then the orange dots are snakes that I have not been able to identify. Um, and uh, so there's a couple observations there that we just don't know for sure what we're looking at because the camera resolution is bad 
uh, or because it's a night vision photo or whatever. Um, but here are some patterns uh, that seem to emerge. Uh, we had cottonmouth activity in April. We didn't get water snakes until about May. All right, so for about a month in the spring, there was cottonmouth activity, but no water snake activity last year. Uh, cottonmouths are active after dark. That, I assume that both of these snakes would be pretty active after dark. But it turns out that we got a lot of cottonmouth activity um, at all hours of the night, but not water snake activity. You notice that all the water snake activity here is in daylight hours. Um, that was a surprise to me. Um, OK. Uh, and then uh, temperature versus date uh, here. So in April, we've got cottonmouth activity from around 19 degrees Celsius up into the um, low 30s. Um, and there's really not a, a significant difference uh, statistically, I'm sure I've done the test, except possibly cottonmouth activity here at a little bit cooler temperatures than uh, water snakes. The water snakes are always up here 26, 27, cottonmouths down here below 20. I don't know if that holds up. Again, we've got to dig through the literature and see uh, if anybody has good field data to compare to this. Um, but there are people using temperature sensitive radio transmitters um, who can measure snake body temperature remotely. And that may, those data might be good to compare to what we're seeing on camera. So uh, cottonmouth active at lower temperatures. Forgot I had a pop up there. Uh, and then temperature versus time of day. Um, and so uh, again, cottonmouth activity when it's dark here and out here. Uh, a little bit, and uh, but daytime activity. Uh, so essentially, uh, data you've seen in previous slides, cotton owls at active at lower temperatures, um, and after midnight, but no water snake <coughs> activity at low temperatures and after midnight. So I don't know if we're really getting at niche partitioning, but you've got two similar sized predators. The prey base that they're going to be feeding on is similar. Fish and frogs, cotton owls probably have a broader diet than the water snakes do, but they certainly are potential competitors here in this stream. So how they're you know, splitting the niche is a, uh, an interesting question. And I think we're getting toward answering that question with these data, but I want at least another year of data to see if any of these trends hold up. So all of this is, again, preliminary uh, results. Uh, people have talked a lot about the effect of moon phase on snakes, so we did a moon phase comparison. And so what you've got here is a graph where I plotted out using the dates that we recorded snakes uh, and, and matching that to the moon phases that were going on at the time. And I plotted out, so moon phase is shown down here with the full moon at, at day zero and then the next full moon at day 28 uh, back here. And what you can see in this, um, the cottonmouth's activity seems to be more abundant near the full moon. If you look in this quadrant right here, the Five days prior to the full moon, we only have one water snake observation. Of course, this is a daytime observation. All right. Uh, this is a nighttime observation up here. This is a nighttime observation. And then uh, the, the same pattern here. After the full moon, cottonmouth activity. Uh, it's daytime activity, except for this one, which is nighttime activity. But no water snake activity near the full moon. I don't know what that means. Um, as you get closer to the, uh, the new moon, though, then we've got daytime water snake activity. Why moon phase at night would affect daytime activity, I don't know. But at least this is an emerging pattern. We'll see if it holds up with another year of data. Okay? Um, and uh, is it possible that cottonmouths are actually showing more diurnal activity um, as the new moon is waxing to full and more nocturnal activity? Uh, sorry, uh, did I do that wrong? I think I did that wrong. This is nocturnal. The circled ones, right? Because here's your time of day. These are nocturnal observations up here. I said diurnal here. I meant to say nocturnal. Oh, I hate it when I make mistakes. In public, no less. Shame on me. All right. Um, so some stream community summary here. Cottonmouth season seems to start early in the year. Water snake activity seems to be diurnal only. Cottonmouths seem to be more active at cooler temperatures maybe more active closer to the full moon, all right? But we've got problems with snake identification. I can't always tell for sure what I'm looking at um, if snakes are small or in the dark. 
Um, and I threw this picture in for Terry Vandevender. I hope he was going to be here. Um, that's either a garter snake or a ribbon snake. I'm not sure which. Um, and I was going to get Terry to look at the, the full version of that picture and get his conclusion on that. So, uh, Tom, you can weigh in too, absolutely. I'll send you the, the picture and you can tell me what you think it is. Um, it's well fed, whatever it is. So. All right, third project. Um, this is our snake hibernaculum project. And Mike Reeves, um, who's been working on the other project too, uh, he and I are working on this together. And what happened is last fall, uh, we uh, came to the conclusion through some observation of a uh, bunch of shed snake skins that this old abandoned structure was serving as a winter hibernaculum for rat snakes. We said, we got to know when they come out of hibernation. Let's get some cameras on this old structure so we can monitor their emergence from hibernation. That would be a fun thing for us to figure out. And so uh, we mounted some cameras to look at this structure. And as you can tell, um, uh, it is, in fact, a hibernaculum for rat snakes. So if you, if you haven't noticed, up here on the roof of the building, there's a, a large rat snake right here. On this barred window, there's a rat snake right here. And then you see the head down here? Okay, so we got three rat snakes in one picture um, uh, at this old abandoned structure. And you can't tell from this angle, but there's, there's uh, uh, two, as far as we can tell, two ways in and out of the hollow concrete block walls. Okay? One of them is that this old window frame allows the snakes to get inside the concrete blocks. Uh, the other one is, if you look, this is a doorway. There's trees in the way, but there's a doorway right here with some breaks in the, in the concrete right here. And uh, it turns out that on the other face of the doorway, you can't see in this picture, there's broken concrete that allows snakes in. So I think we've got a video on the next slide here. And if you watch carefully, uh, here's a, a rat snake down here on the window. Here's a rat snake emerging right here while this one is still down on the window. That one goes, that one goes. This one's back, and then there's one that just zipped up the tree. There, its tail is just disappearing right there. And then that one. So lots of snake activity, right? And all that, I don't remember, that's like a, a two-hour time period or something that you just watched in 20 seconds. Um, and uh, so I'm really intrigued by the potential things we could learn from this. Uh, we started our, our spring cameras on February 1st. And we saw no evidence of snake activity until February 19th. And on February 19th, we had a snake basking in that window um, from uh, before noon here uh, till mid-afternoon here. Uh, that was the appearance of one snake uh, that day. And then um, as the month of February progressed, uh, you can see the snake activity plotted out that we saw. It's all diurnal. It's all snakes coming out during the day, during daylight hours coming out of that window and basking in the sun. In some cases, they slither away. They go up on the roof of the building and they leave the scene. Okay? Or they come back across the roof of the building and go back in the window. And I don't have those data marked on here where the departures and the arrivals are. Right? But what I figured was going to happen is the snakes are going to warm up. Right? They're going to spend a few days basking and they're going to decide, hey, it's spring, it's time to go you know, raid bird nests and find baby pack rats and things like that, and, and that they would disperse, and that maybe by mid-March, we would cease to see any snake activity. All right. Um, here's some uh, ambient temperature versus time of day, uh, or sorry, versus date. And so what you can see is snake activity initially, 25 degrees, 20 degrees. Uh, this initial cluster of activity, February 19th, 20th, 21st, was all above 20. Um, we did get some cooler activity around 15 degrees, um, but not until a week or so after the first spring snake activity. Um, but for the most part, the, the activity is uh, above 20 degrees. Here's, a, here's another plot of that time of day and temperature. And you see the snakes do a lot of basking here from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, at a range of temperatures from about 20 to more than 30 degrees Celsius. But there was one little sort of cold front came through for a day or two. Was that one or two days, Mike? Do you remember? I believe it was two. Was it two days? We had a couple cooler days, and yet there was snake activity, uh, you know, basking on the window. 
Well, we thought they, were, they would do that, that they would bask, and then they would disperse, and that would be the end of it. Um, and it turns out that's not the case. Um, uh, it turns out that uh, they're still active. Here we are May 1st, and as of yesterday, uh, they're still using this structure, going in that window, going in the, the broken concrete block at the door, coming and going. And so it's not just a winter hibernaculum. It seems to be an activity center, a focal point where multiple snakes are coming and going, even though they're scattering out to do their thing. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. We're pretty sure there's at least five snakes using this. Uh, we've had as many as three on camera at once, but when you watch, say, one disappears out of the scene, and then very shortly another one arrives that's clearly a different size and that sort of stuff, I'm 100% confident there's four individuals, but I'm pretty sure there's five. Uh, so uh, relationship between activity, time, and temperature is one thing we're working on. But what about seasonal pattern? I thought I you know, was going to look at a winter hibernaculum that would be abandoned for the summer, but apparently not. Um, and then what about potential for social interaction? If you've got five adult snakes sharing this spot, can we recognize individuals and figure anything out about their comings and goings? What's the sex ratio of these snakes? Are they all the same sex or is there any difference? Are they going to be mating here in mating season? Will we see any courtship and mating behavior potentially? If females are hanging out here, where are they going to lay their eggs? Is there nesting habitat right here at this building that makes it attractive as a year-round site? And will we see juveniles? So far, we have not had any small snakes on camera. Um, and uh, for a couple of reasons, I suspect. One is that window um, can only be, you saw the snakes go from the window up to the roof of the building. You got to be a four foot snake to do that. You, you just can't do it if you're little because the concrete is smooth. There's no mortar joints or anything like that. Um, so I think that window is exclusive to big snakes. But there is ground access at the front of the building for smaller snakes, yet we're not seeing any. So I'm, I'm not sure what that's about. Um, but lots of open questions here about uh, hibernaculum. So uh, challenges to this, okay? One of them is every photo that I take is stamped with time, date, and temperature. And I don't just need the data for the photos that have animals. I need the data for the photos that don't because I need to know what was the coldest temperature that day or the warmest temperature that day or whatever. And when my students are going through thousands of photos, it's hard enough to get them to find all the animals. But if I say, I need you to also find the lowest temperature, they're going to re rebel. That's just not going to happen. So what I really need is I need a computer program that can use optical character recognition to go through my photos and find those data and store them in a, in a uh, spreadsheet for me. Um, so that's a, a tool that I need, and I need it fast because my hard drive holds six terabytes of photos and I'm about 98% full. And I'm gonna to have to start throwing away data to make room for new photos. And I'm in kind of semi-crisis mode. I've got about two weeks. And then I'm gonna to have to start throwing away photos. Um, so I'm trying to figure out if there's a good tool I can adopt, adapt, whatever, to extracting those data from photos. Um, and then, of course, the holy grail here would be automated recognition of animals, right? If I could have a computer go through stacks and stacks of photos, it'd be wonderful if it could say, oh, that's an adult female rat snake. That's not likely to happen, you know? But if it could at least say this photo probably has an animal in it because it's somewhat different from the previous photo that didn't have an animal, um, it wouldn't have to be a sophisticated computer program, um, but it would have to be able to handle a fast analysis of thousands of pictures. Um, and so those are two things that I'm, I'm working on right now. And uh, one of my students who is a biology major but really interested in computer applications has been working this semester with me to write a program to screen photos. And we've had some success, but neither of us is up to speed to where we need to be to make it really work. So, uh, so that's a problem, okay? Uh, and in fact, this cartoon gets at it. These two people are sitting here, and the, the uh, person in the back says, when a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they're in a national park. And the woman at the computer here, she says, sure, easy GIS lookup. Give me a few hours. 
He says, and check whether the photo is a bird. And she says, I'll need a research team in five years. Um, it turns out that um, one of the very earliest attempts at doing things like facial recognition was done by a computer scientist back in the 1970s who put two undergraduates on a project for the summer thinking that by the end of the summer they'd have facial recognition. One, one professor and two undergraduates, they'd have functional facial recognition in photos. Well, it's you know 45 years later and we're still not there completely. So uh, it's hard to get computers to recognize some things that to a human are obvious. All right. So I got a huge list of people that have helped on this project and I can't possibly read all their names and I'm sure I've left somebody off. Uh, but I should point out that all of these are um, students who uh, either for credit or for volunteer or for extra credit or something went through thousands of photos and we wouldn't be where we are with this project without all their help. And so lots of help there. Um, but then the folks up here are the biology majors in particular who've uh, done more than that. Um, and so uh, I, I have to give a nod to all of them. So I'm interested in what your questions are. I'm interested in any suggestions you have to help me refine this or tackle it or whatever. And if you can think of collaborators that I should be talking to, computer science type people or whatever, to help me with some of this, I'd love to have contacts, uh, people I should uh, sort of share some of these problems with and see if they can help out. Um, so I'll stop there, except I got some fun photos. Let me rip through about 15 fun photos and then, and then we'll, we'll, I'll take your questions. Um, wood ducks. Great egret. Can you tell what that is on the log? That's a possum. Pretty sure that's a possum. Okay. This was a mystery to us. Um, this thing right here, um, and uh, several of us zoomed in on the photo and scratched our heads for quite a while. And one of my students, uh, Kelsey Houghton, had, had some insight, and she looked at the reflection in the water and said, oh, look, it's a squirrel. A squirrel's tail is wet. And the fur is all spiked up, and I couldn't recognize what it was. But it's a squirrel when you look at the reflection. That's fun. Um, gray blue heron, river otter. Where are my Audubon friends? You got that one? Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Red shoulder. Red shoulder. Juvenile red shouldered hawk. This one here. Yeah, a little eastern chipmunk. Uh, this one here. See it? Gray rat snake. That one? Schnauzer? <laughs> I hope not. Bobcat. I think bobcat. I think bobcat. But you, you know, some of these are going to be a little ambiguous, a little tough to tell. Uh, that one's a slider by my estimation, tracking scripta. Um, oh, this series. I want to show you this here. Um, the scene was plain. That's basically mud covered with dead leaves. And then this strange something shows up right here. There's four photos in the sequence. I'm going to show you all four, and then you're going to tell me what you're looking at. So that thing shows up um, at 12.38 uh, a.m. And then that scene, and then that, and then that. And I'll ask you what that is. Two river arters playing. Oops, too fast. I shared this with some uh, uh, mammalogy friends, and they concluded that what that is, I'll back up. That's that's a possum. And it's attacking, scavenging what I think is maybe an injured house cat. I'm not sure. Uh, I thought it was a mink, maybe, but other people said no, they thought it was a cat. And then, of course, speaking of cats, you know, in Mississippi we have black panthers, right? And everybody always says, where's your camera evidence? So here's my Mississippi black panther, which may in fact be the same animal that the possum is attacking. Uh, I don't know. So um, uh, there's no black panthers, okay? 
Can we get that out of the way? Um, is, your, is your creek in Mississippi? Yes. Yeah, it's in Hines County. I, I, I'm a little uh, reluctant to say more than that because sooner or later somebody's going to start stealing my cameras and vandalizing equipment and things like that. Huh? I'm a little reluctant to say more than Hines County, Tom, but I'll talk to you privately. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, we'll have to we'll have to have a conversation. All right. Um, uh, so uh, I'm done. Uh, questions, comments, suggestions. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. I wish I've looked in the what photographers call the EXIF, the exposure information. I've looked, and apparently this camera manufacturer doesn't put it in there, which frustrates the heck out of me. But it's not there. I, I've tried a couple different viewers that will pull up the metadata, and I don't see it. I see a whole bunch of stuff in the metadata. I wish I could find it in there, but it, it unless it's coded in there in hexadecimal or something. You know what I mean? If there's some correlate in there that I could find, but I have not found it. Have you asked the manufacturer? I have not asked the manufacturer, and that's probably a smart step, uh, would be to, to just ask them if it's encoded in there in some fashion. You're right. Yeah. I, I would hope so. Um, but I, so far, I haven't found it there. So. Gina. What about the data logger methods? I know that we require more money. I don't know how expensive they are. But if you're interested in the, the temperature data, would you be willing to combine your... Yeah. Um, I actually have um, a couple little data logger devices um, that I could deploy. Um, and uh, for various reasons, I just haven't. Um, it's just one more thing to fuss with. Well, it's easier if it's just the right. camera would right? Right. Um, it seemed, it, that, I guess that's part of my frustration is I'm getting five temperatures every minute from five separate devices. Why do I need a sixth device out there? You know, when clearly I've got the data. I just need to get the data into an electronic format. So... But yeah, that'd be nice. So. Unfortunately, I've got a little too much experience recently with uh, the security industry and cameras that are using white balance to detect motion Ooh. rather than infrared or, or whatever. So it's, it, 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 since, since cameras are digital, they detect white balance and start snapping pictures, saving it to a, a DVR. Mm -hmm. And then the DVR also has software to blow through it real quick to, to see changes in white balance in your pictures, you know, if it's sitting on the same scene all the time. But, uh, of course, those are made to be mounted indoors with right. all different technology. Right. I, I would need waterproof Pelican cases and batteries and inverters. and uh, So um, if you know of some money laying around to help finance that stuff, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Just an observation on... Uh, Yeah. Um, they're looking at turtles. Maybe? Yes, they were trying okay. to see about basking turtles, but what they were capturing instead was cut um, at their site. Um, and that's what they're posting about. But I wonder if they're using a similar a camera and how they're extracting potentially similar data. Okay. That might be a good idea then to talk to them. Go ahead. I have seen a hybrid in a small screen. I'm not surprised now because I've now seen it several times over the course of a year. But when I first saw it, it was to me it was a jaw dropping. Oh my gosh, there's an otter on this on this picture um, because it's just not the kind of habitat I had ever seen an otter in. So, 
Um, but I think that speaks to my ignorance of otter ecology more than it <laughs> speaks to uh, this otter being different uh, or something like that. So I think there are people out there who just know otters better than I do, and if I talk to them, uh, they'll probably tell me that this is no big deal. Um, I figured it was you know, some juvenile male who was looking for a new home, and he would pass through, and I'd never see him again. Um, so when he shows up several times over the course of a year, he, I don't know if it's a he, I don't know if it's the same otter, uh, but still, interesting question. You were finding uh, cottonmouths were active uh, late in the evening, midnight evening. Um, they generally hunt ectotherms, but they do have infrared capability. Right. Um, you think they're using it for something? In my understanding, cottonmouths have a broad diet. Right? They, they eat endotherms when they can catch them, and uh, they, I've got a friend who uh, has done a lot of snake behavior work where he does direct observation with night vision cameras. So he actually puts on mosquito netting, grabs a night vision video camera, and he wades into the swamp and hunts down snakes, and then he shoots video of them. Um, and he has detected, I don't know if he's published any of this, but he has detected cottonmouths um, uh, setting up uh, vigilance points, you know, where they're, they're hunting at the same spot night after night. And um, he's got video of them, you know, hitting mice that come down to the stream to drink, and the cottonmouth is waiting in an ambush posture and nails the mouse. And then, you know, two nights later, that cottonmouth is back at the same spot. Um, and, and he's also seen cases where uh, a cottonmouth will hunt at a spot and then abandon it. And another snake will take up that exact same position a few nights later. And he suspects that the cottonmouths are actually scent marking these, these spots. Um, and so between the scent of a place that a rodent frequency drink, frequently drinks and a snake frequently, you know, is, is in an ambush there, the next snake can figure out, hey, this is this is a good hunting spot. So I think that uh, even if they're predominantly eating other snakes, fish, frogs, um, small turtles, uh, whatever else, even if they're predominantly eating that stuff, they're still hunting mammals. Um, so uh, the breadth of their diet is huge. So if it'll fit in their in their head, they're going to eat it. So, um, and and I wouldn't at all be surprised if uh, the cottonmouths in this stream are eating any juvenile water snakes they can swallow, which you know is both prey and potentially removing a competitor. So. Anything else? Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming.